and I was like, do you, I was like, went to the guy. I was like, where are your yams? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Sincast, presented by CinemaSins. All right, everybody, welcome to the Sincast. This is Chris Atkinson from CinemaSins, joined as always by the voice of CinemaSins, Jeremy Scott. Hello, everyone. And for music video sins, Barrett Share. Hello? Hello! He's not sure. He's, he's it's a question mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm Ron, Ron Burgundy. Burgundy. <laughs> yep. Um. Yeah, today we're going to be doing a you know a regular ass, uh, bo- uh, regular ass. Well, I was about to say bonus. We already did the bonus. <laughs> regular we're doing a regular ass. ass pod today, guys. Regular yeah, ass, ass pod. Yep, that's right. Uh, it's a wrap. with ones with huh? It's what? a wrap. A regular yeah, a ass pod. That's right. Uh, you, you know your your usual thing with your rants and your recommends and your warns and your and your questions and your what have you. So I brought got, all that some, shit. Yeah, we got mm-hmm. some stuff backed up. Like we, we we're turning blue. Mm-hmm. We're backed up. That's we're, right. we're gonna mm-hmm. we're gonna spew. That's correct. Our content all mm-hmm. over your. That's right. <laughs> your mm-hmm. backside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to make that sexual. What you just said. Yeah, it's um, so hard. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know uh, what is what? What's everybody uh, upset about lately? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. I'm as mad as hell. You've never seen me very upset. You make anything that they're angry about? Listen, I got to tell you something. This is not a political statement. <clears throat> this is not a political statement. But you people with truck flags. Now, <clears throat> mm-hmm. I don't mean little flags on the cab of the truck that whip in the wind, and they're like. The size of a piece of paper. Mm-hmm. I'm talking mm-hmm. about a very specific kind of person who has an eight foot pole on their tow hitch. Oh, and Jesus. at the end of that pole is a five to 10 foot flag. Damn. Now, mm. It might. I have seen them that say Trump. I have seen yes. them that say Biden. I have seen them that are Confederate flags. I've seen them that are American flags. I've seen them that are Tennessee, Auburn fan flags, mm. Alabama fan flags. Listen, I don't give a shit what's on your flag. Your flag may say peace and love for everyone. Your flag may be literally golden jizz. But if it is on an eight-foot pole (laughs) on your tow hitch, flapping in the wind, it is a danger to society. And you are just being obnoxious. You're not supporting something. A bumper sticker says, I have feelings about something. An eight Football with a ginormous flag says, you need to hear my feelings. And I hate yeah. it. Everybody, Drives me angry. Everybody's still thinking about golden jizz. Uh, yeah, is I, the jizz golden or is it gold and jizz? Gold and jizz. I'm oh. saying even if it was flipping off and the golden jizz was landing on me and I was loving it, the flag mm. is still obnoxious. I don't yeah. care what the flag <laughs> it's like, is. You're like, yeah, you're like driving behind that and you're like, you have to put on your windshield wipers and he's like, like, I don't worry about it, honey. It's just the golden jizz flag. <laughs> I have, I have, I have inadvertently gotten us off message. The point is, <laughs> those giant flags, no matter what is on them, I don't care if you have a signed Stanley Kubrick poster flag, it's obnoxious, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you're being obnoxious. Yeah, and, and I, yeah, I, I not everybody, you. not everybody needs to know exactly what you think about things all the time. Just You're... buy a bumper sticker, man. Be a normal person. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. What's your I What's your main? These flags are even roadworthy. Unless you're at a parade, I don't think this is road legal. But people do it all the time here. I I agree, and I, I t- totally agree with this rant. But what is the main beef that you have with it? That the 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 the, the messaging itself, or the the method of the messaging? I think it's dangerous. My main beef is it's obnoxious. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If, yeah. They, if you and I were in one, the room together, a room together, and you said, oh, "I like the Green Bay Packers," we might have a conversation. I might nod or take note of it. But if you got up and ran to my side of the room, threw me in the corner, and screamed, "I like the Green Bay Packers," you would be an asshole. Mm-hmm. Right? I see what you mean. I see what you mean. That's a that's a very good way to say it. Yeah. yeah. So mm-hmm. fuck Thank those you. truck flags. Mm-hmm. Yeah, truck yeah. flags can eat my ass. Well, and 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 really, you didn't make a political statement, but I kind of will. <laughs> Motherfuck, 
your Confederate flags well, down yeah, here, at least around our area. You, t- you talk about a method of messaging. What are you trying to get across? I'm a racist piece of shit. You're trying that's to intimidate. You're yes. Yes. You're trying to yes. intimidate. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. 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 Well, we live in a very, we live in a high density of racist population kind of area. And yes. uh, that's what I believe those ginormous flags are. No matter what the message, it's, it's intimidation. It's, it's, you will look at my shit, God damn it. And I just think yeah. that's selfish. I just think yeah. it's very self-centered. Support your team. I don't care if you wrap your truck in Titans gear. Just don't put one of those giant flags on the back, you ass. <laughs> Gotta support the team. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't care if you're a face painter or not. <laughs> <laughs> I paint uh, my face. <laughs> um, uh, my, you know, yeah, for for people who are who are non sports fans and people who don't like the NFL and stuff, my rant's not going to appeal to them very much. Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, but, um, I think, I think you can learn some things about life and about the way, uh, coaches, uh, uh, direct their teams when they're behind in a game, uh, in the fourth quarter and everything. You can learn a few things about life. You can, you can go to other areas of life with this type of stuff. I don't understand, especially when a team is down by two touchdowns in a, in a game, why they do the, I'm going to do what the defense lets me do basically. Where they're like, I'll the, the defense says you can have this ten yard area in front of us here. We're just going to defend all the the big stuff back here so that you can't can't do that and whatever. Sorry, you need you as the offense need to go after things that you normally can't get in order to make this uh, a, a a contest anymore. You're not mm-hmm. going to be able to do it by throwing ten yard passes over and over and over and over again. You're just wasting time and you're wasting everybody who's watching it time. You just, you, 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 it makes no sense. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, the chances of your pass getting intercepted, very, very high or or incomplete, whatever. It's very high, but also your chances of winning the game are slightly better. If -hmm. you try to do something that's a little off kilter, and 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 yet these coaches week after week they're down by 14 with like three minutes left and they sit there and do this 10 yards 10 yards 10 yards and then it's like a minute and 20 seconds left by the time they get down there and they may score a touchdown then they have to do this onside kick thing you know it's it's usually not going to work you have to get that touchdown within a minute or else you're not going to win this game and yep. yet they still do this bullshit over and over and over again. You got to throw something deep and hope that you got the guy catches it. Um, mm-hmm. They do this stuff too. I think, I think a lot of the times these decisions are made because, uh, because they don't want to look stupid. They don't want to have something that looks dumb. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, they, they don't want to be judged on something really dumb that, you know, whatever. But at, at that point in the game, who cares? Just, just throw out all, of that you have if you want to actually win that game and i'm i wonder sometimes if they actually do Mm. um if you really want to win that game then you have to go all out they do this i I saw a game over the weekend where the jets were down like 21 to nothing and it was like fourth and 20 which sucks but guess what field goals don't matter (laughs) and they go they go out and kick a field goal and i'm like (sighs) what does this do other yep. than it, it takes the shutout off the board. Mm-hmm. Great, it sh- nobody cares. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, well, some gamblers probably do. <laughs> yeah, gamblers definitely do. Gamblers are like, "What the shit is this?" <laughs> um, but uh, but that's that's sort of the thing. Like, I, I you see that in a lot of sports where it's just like, you know, they they always do the wrong thing, like the 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 texans against the titans did that thing where they went for two and yeah if they get it they've pretty much sealed the game but if they kick the extra point they've made the titans job so hard to tie the game that it's a chance that you you know you i mean you have a better chance of winning under that circumstance and i'm sure that Mm. there i'm sure that there's somebody out there with the stats and they say you gotta go for two there all the time blah 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 i'm sorry It, it seems like to me with the amount of time involved and everything you can, you know, you can. Uh... You're talking about the Titans Texans game, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They definitely should have kicked that field or extra point. Kicked Going the extra for two point was, was dumb. 
going for two, if you, if you get it, obviously you, you win. Yeah, there's no, there's no way around it. You win. But if you kick the extra point, then you've made it that much harder. There's a lot of people who have that, that mentality about basketball games that I'll never understand where they're like, Oh, I don't want to foul somebody who's trying to shoot the three pointer because, uh, uh, you know, because you get three uh, they, foul shots. <laughs> yeah. And, and, or, well, you foul them. The, the, the idea is to foul them before they can shoot the three pointer. That's the right. Thing. If you're up by three, then you want to foul. You want to foul yeah. so that they can, you know, they can, they can hit it. But I remember hearing Eddie Fogler, who was a old Vandy coach once uh, get on there and say, well, yeah, but, but what if they get up to the foul line and they make the first one and then they intentionally miss the next one and then you get the layup? I'm like, you, did you just hear yourself what you just said? How hard that is? <laughs> you, if you make it harder for the other team to win, then you're going to win most of the time. Yeah, I do think uh, there's a lot of overthinking it. The thing that bugs me is if you want to make that risk, if you do want to do what Cornell did and go for two in that instance – I hate the whole, we were trying to win the game. I mean, yeah, everybody's trying to win the fucking game. Like, your percentages, mm-hmm. you made a, a poor percentage choice. Just own it. And I think he did, to be honest. Um, but often you see people who go for two and lose a game because of it. Like, if you kick the extra point, you tie. But if you get the two-point conversion, you win the game with no second left. Teams that go for that and lose, they're always like, well, we, we're trying to win the game. We're always trying to win the game. You know, you tie mm-hmm. in that instance, take the fucking coin toss, and win in overtime. Like yeah. a sensible person who knows what math means. Which is what uh, Vrabel did at the in the Tennessee game. Uh, yeah. He was even smarter than that with that fucking yeah. penalty he did. <laughs> it was great. Was awesome. It was great. I am really – I was – okay, so the Colts were on – and the Titans were on at the same time. Uh, mm-hmm. and the Colts are almost never on here. I root for both teams, but I was watching the Titans game, flipping over to the Colts game because the Titans game was a lot more interesting. Oh, yeah, the, man. There's a ton of quarter. points. The Titans <laughs> have become, like, exciting to watch. It's Very, I almost tweeted, uh, are the Titans great? <laughs> like, as I long mean, as yeah. nothing happens to Derrick Henry, I think they are, are competitive with anybody I've seen so far. Or even Tannehill. I think Tannehill... Uh, should get a lot, not that he didn't get paid this off season, but I don't think people hold him in the esteem that you, you hold the, the higher quarterbacks, you know? No, but still, no, I still think Derrick Henry is the MVP of the team for sure. Yeah. 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 They, they, they definitely are exciting. They, they sneakily score tons of points. Like yeah. you would, <laughs> <Yeah>. never <laughs> really, you never really uh, put them in that category before, but the last two games, I think they went over 40 twice. So, and I am yeah. sure that I'm sure that and there might've been a defensive touchdown in one of those, but still, that's still a lot of points uh, mm-hmm. that they putting up on the board and uh, uh, they are fun to watch. It's crazy. Plus I don't, I mean, I, plus I don't like to root for, for Philip Rivers. So I'm having yeah. a weird, that's, I'm having a weird Colts so weird. season because <laughs> I really don't like Philip Rivers at all. Yeah. <laughs> I don't blame so I'm you. just trying to root for the team sans him. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay. This is going to be beating a dead horse, but I've got specific examples. And this mm. also is not a political statement. Mm. Mm. Wear a fucking mask. Mm. Okay. Mm. Wear mm. a fucking mask. Mm-hmm. Went on vacation uh, a couple weeks ago and I have, I have gotten over a lot of anxiety around my routine and around my house, obviously. But even when I go to the store, um, you know, I have protocol. I know, I know what to do. To minimize the anxiety. And I like going to the store. So I mask up. Everybody has masks on mostly at, uh, in, around Nashville. So I go on vacation to a small town and, uh, I go to, uh, there's a couple of instances where I nearly had a panic attack. One, I went to the grocery store mm-hmm. and so I go to the grocery store. I walk in, see a mask on that guy. All right, cool. See a mask on that guy. See a mask on that woman. Yeah, everybody's still doing it, even though we're in rural uh, backwoods mountain town. Uh, so I'm walking around. I'm feeling pretty good. Now, this is a store that I don't know. That's very important. If mm-hmm. you go to a store that you don't know, it's impossible to find anything. Uh, yeah. You go to your, your familiar store. You know exactly where to go. You've got your routine. You've got your thing. This one was an Ingles. It was super spread out. <clears throat> Fuck and, Ingles. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and it, it was just a very confusing. Okay, so that's all right. But then I see this uh, probably a guy my age, completely without a mask. I look over. He's talking to his uh, wife or girlfriend 
also without a mask. Mm -hmm. I turn over. There's a fucking police officer Mm -hmm. walking down with his basket, not wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, were you afraid he was going to smell your weed? Mm -hmm. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Then there's more and more and more. So I start getting, and they're right up on you too. And so I start getting very, very anxious. I'm like, you know, I'm, it's before I could really like talk myself down and say like, you're protected. Everything's fine. But this was just in my head so much that I froze. I completely froze. I am an all-star when it comes to grocery shopping, okay? Mm. I always get the best deals. I always get the best products. Mm. I, I know I'm sounding like Trumpian here, but I, I am proud of my grocery store ability. No one has ever done more for grocery shopping in the history of the, this country than Barrett. Mm-hmm. Correct. I am, I am proficient is all I'm saying. I started grabbing everything. I grabbed some some trout. I was like, I can probably do something with that. I grabbed some broccolini. I was like, I grabbed a sweet potato. No. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I fucking oh. hate sweet potatoes. Oh. I, it was just like, I could probably roast this. I do that. I grabbed a jar of olives that were not pitted. I, oh. came, I came back to the cabin. My wife is like, oh, what did you get? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I started start pulling out things. She's like, sweet potatoes? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I could probably do something with that. And she was like, oh, all those. They're not pitted. And I was like, I don't know. I froze. <laughs> it was a very, just wear a goddamn mask. And I, I won't be picking random shit off of the, I got like two tubs of butter. Like it was mm, just, mm, like, mm, mm. what am I going to coat myself in it? Mm-hmm. The only other time, wear a fucking mask, people. The only other sweet time, potatoes. sweet potatoes. What the fuck? Uh, I still have it, by the way. Uh, I haven't cooked it yet. <laughs> the only What's other it? time, huh? What's the other name for sweet potato? Is it yam? Mm-hmm. I think they're yam. technically the same thing, right? Yeah, I, I, I. Uh, it was funny uh, because I went. I did not know this. I did not know it had another name. One time, and I, I had a uh, some sort of a, a thing ingredient that had had sweet potatoes in it. And, or maybe it said yams. And I was like, do you, I was like, went to the guy. I was like, where are your yams? <laughs> <laughs> this is like, oh, I'm going to write some gay fan fiction about this. Awesome. And, and, no, come back here, sir. I will show you my yams. <laughs> and he was like, uh, you mean sweet potatoes? And I was like, I don't know. It says yams. I don't know what the fuck that means. He goes, oh, yeah, there's so yams or sweet potatoes. Fuck. Okay. <laughs> they are technically different. Uh, but they're close enough that most people like the skin is different. That's basically mm. it. Okay. Yeah. Inside, they're all the same. Just like, <laughs> just like you, just like everybody at the end of volcano. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. The last time this happened, uh, I, I wanted to describe a beautiful thing. I went to play golf uh, while I was gone with my wife and son. It was glorious. We get there, very foggy in the mountains and everything. Mountain course, very hard. But we get there. I got to rent the clubs, right, for my son. Everybody mask up. The guy who gets our cart for us, masked up, uh, staying six feet or more away. We're we're talking. Everything could not go uh, more lovely. It's a great course. So we go out and play. It made sure that we had enough carts for for the the three of us, just us. We didn't get paired up with anybody. Just a delightful experience. Mm. I get back. You get your mask back on after you, you pull back in. And this old timer comes up to me and uh, starts wiping down my clubs. And as I'm trying to get them out of the golf cart, no mask. And he is right up on me. He's like, how's the course? And I was like trying to move away, but also trying to grab my clubs. And I was like, oh, it was great. It was awesome. It was fantastic. He gets right up in my fucking face without a mask. And he's like, oh, I'll clean your clubs up for you. Hey, obviously, this is somebody that works for the course. But uh, it, it, it ruined the mm-hmm. entire experience mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I go to all this trouble and this goddamn motherfucker decides to stick his fucking maskless face in my face. Mm-hmm. If he doesn't want to wear a mask, stand over there and talk to me, you motherfucking asshole, mm-hmm. fuck cock shit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. anyway... Mm-hmm. Wear a mask, people. I am. It's now almost November. We should not be telling your ass to wear a fucking mask. Wear a fucking mask. Wear a fucking mask. Fuck you with my dick. Fuck you with my dick. Yeah, my dick. Fuck you with my dick. My dick. 
Um, I have noticed a distinct difference in Publix. Uh, I was actually at Publix and Kroger this morning. Um, and uh, Publix, everybody had a mask, customers mm-hmm. uh, and employees. Kroger, all employees had a mask. Half the customers had a mask. Yep. And thankfully, I was only going to Kroger for a few small items. So a zippity doo dah in and out of there. Um, but at least in my locality, Publix is a safer feeling place to me than my nearest Kroger. And uh, I can't say that's true everywhere, obviously. But the, When this all started and everything, you go to Publix. This is why I had stuff delivered for a while there. Um, there was no... Uh, there was no sense of what people needed to do at the time. Like, I right. mean, I, I even went to places without a mask. I was just, you know, cause no, I didn't know. Um, and, uh, and then when people started, you know, it started being apparent that, you know, you're putting the mask on to, uh, prevent others from getting it and everything like that. Uh, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely wear a mask. Uh, and, and Publix is very helpful about having that up front. You, you know, and, and there, I mean, bigger places can probably handle it, but you know, like gas stations I've been to, they have that same sign. It doesn't matter. They don't have any way of controlling it. They have no power. Um, but, um, but Publix, once they, once they had that in place where it showed, well, I had basically two, two different signs where it said, you got to have one to get in here. I, d- I have not ever seen going into Publix anybody wear- not wearing one, um, and uh, and it, and it's made it way easier to go in and you know if I need groceries I can go now instead of like you know getting online and trying to order some shit that may not even be what I want uh, when it when it finally gets there and everything but um, but uh, yeah it's 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 way more comforting when you have that going on rather than yeah. what this this uh wild west bullshit where it's like it's okay if you it's you know that's your that's your prerogative and everything and it's has no. nothing to do with your prerogative it has nothing to do with that that's you are fucking me you are yeah. fucking me yeah by, exactly. with your smug ass face without a mask no, and this guy looked over at me i gave him the stink eye and he was like I was like, oh, I want to punch you right now. Look, here's a headline from today. Tennessee hits new hospitalization record for COVID-19. Mm-hmm. New, new record for hospitalization. Mm-hmm. The, like, the, it's not gone, people. It's not, it's not only not gone, it's getting worse. The, the, uh, the, the, the issue that a lot of people don't understand is that the hospitalization thing, once you start getting it to the point where they're overstuffed with people, you know, then it it becomes a bigger problem than it was when it's just what we've been dealing with the past few months. They start turning away other patients. They start yeah. turning away ER patients. They start turning away surgery patients. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's got a huge ripple effect. And it's scary as hell. It's scary and as hell. And most of this, or a lot of this, is caused by people who don't want to wear a goddamn mask because they're, they're fucking us. They're fucking us. Yeah. 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 So anyway, I have a sweet potato and some olives. In my refrigerator right now. Uh, and, uh, from two weeks ago. From two weeks ago. I'm glad that you brought it back with you instead of just like giving it to the woods. I've just been like, give you back and give you a sweet potato to the woods. And a whole ceremony and shit. I'm just I'm saying, I am <laughs> giving the butter to the woods. <laughs> I'm sure well, there's a sun rays come through the trees and shit. <laughs> Why'd you drive with that shit? You drove like a few hours back home with a sweet. It potato. didn't take up a lot of room. No, I just but put you're the not going to use it. In the van. Oh, might as well <laughs> you be giving it back. <laughs> hey, the supermarket I bought it, there, guys. <laughs> you can sell it again. <laughs> it you hasn't been used. Dip. I swear. <laughs> it still has the plastic covering over it and everything. <laughs> Mm. Jesus. Uh, anybody got any uh, recommends and warns? Some some movies and some shit. Totes amaze balls. There go right. It won the Academy Award. Oh, for what? For best movie ever made. So there's a person I correspond with on Facebook who who uh, recommended recommended a couple of movies to me. So I'm going to recommend to the world now. Oh, mm. uh, one of the movies is called Cosmos. Um, it came out last year and it has nobody you've heard of probably in it. Um, uh, but it's about these three guys who drive out into the woods 
And uh, one of these one of these people has developed a program that uh, can that has sort of color coded signals in space, so he can map the the uh, the signals going on in space and everything. Um, one of the guys is uh, the guy who's driving has is, is used to be a part of this um, this uh, this lab or whatever that used to do uh, that used to build satellites, and he's bringing his buddy along who ha- he hasn't seen in forever for for reasons we won't know until later on in the movie. Uh, who was also on that team who built a satellite that's currently orbiting and everything. Anyway, this guy, this middle guy who's, or, who's done this program is, is he's searching for something out there in space. He is, uh, he's, he's hoping that his program will help. And one day he, he sends a message uh, out into, and in, into the great beyond. And uh, this uh, message comes back to him and they're trying to figure out whether it is from, uh, so a, a, an intelligent life or not, but it's really the, the, the idea behind it is not so much what they're doing. It's a really good character driven dialogue kind mm-hmm. of movie. Um, the, the relationships that are involved here, um, uh, you know, why is that, why are these two people, why are these two people, uh, in the front of the, of the van that's dry, you know, at the beginning of the movie, why do they seem like they have a bit of a strained relationship? We don't know why. Um, the guy in the back who's made this program and everything, he doesn't, he doesn't know one of the guys and, but there's a, there's some sort of strain there for some reason. Um, but uh, it's just them in this. It's it's like it's almost like a. a it's almost like you know how um, Locke is. Only it's three people inside of a car for the most part of the movie, and they're just trying to you know they're trying to locate the the signal from space and everything. And I don't really want to say much more about the movie because there's a lot of you know there's some surprises and things like that. But uh, I it, you know it's got like a five point eight on the IMDb. Mm-hmm. And I was uh, I was discussing this phenomenon. I feel like if you put like Ryan Reynolds or somebody in this movie, and 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 you know, and he's just one of the characters, this would have shot up to about a six point five or a six point six hmm. or something like that. Because I feel like a lot of times people on the IMDb are like, I don't know anybody in this, and it's it doesn't seem like a a real movie to me, a big movie to me. So five point, you know, whatever. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, it's really, it's, it's really interesting how it goes about its business. It is not, of course, scientifically accurate at all or anything. <laughs> uh, but it is, uh, I had a great, de- I had a great deal of fun with it. Hmm. Um, uh, and, uh, I don't know if I've done it any justice, but I, I feel like Cosmos. It was- Interesting. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are going to know Cosmos, the TV show that uh-huh. you know. Uh, was it uh, who was it? Carl it was Sagan. Neil deGrasse Tyson, and then who else was uh, the first one? Uh, Carl Sagan. Carl, oh, Carl Sagan. Sagan. Um, I will said Seth MacFarlane. So, you know, <laughs> well, Seth MacFarlane, <laughs> Seth MacFarlane produced the Neil deGrasse yeah, yeah. Tyson one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, th- it, it came out last year. This movie, and it's it's really good. I really All like- right, I'll check it out. I'll yeah. totally check that. That's, that's right up my that's, alley. Yeah, I like I like when the recommends are are deep cuts I've never heard of. That's a good one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, Barrett, you or me? Yeah, all right, I'll go. Yeah, all right. We need to talk about cats. Cats. The movie, the movie cats. The movie cats. The mm. the the Taylor Swift James Corden movie cats. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. They, by the way, they're in there for like three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you, mm-hmm. I took the plunge. And I watched Cats because I, I watch I watch uh, movies that, that people say are no good and mm-hmm. see if they're good or not. Mm-hmm. This mm-hmm. this one's this one's no good. Yeah, this, <laughs> everything bad that you've heard about this movie, from the effects, I'm getting choked up just thinking about it. From the effects to the acting to the the buttholes and the tail boners. I thought there the, were buttholes. No, there's not buttholes. Okay. All right. What are you talking so, about? There's buttholes. No, there's no buttholes. I, I thought searched. you said you were complaining about the buttholes, and I said I thought there wasn't any buttholes. No, there was not. Correct. Yes. Okay. There's no buttholes. Mm-hmm. All right. I'll be. shut up. I'm sorry. All right. Man. <clears throat> you watch cats. All right. Cats. So I think I did see cats uh, on, on stage at some point in my life when I was a, a young buck. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and mm-hmm. I didn't remember much about it. I remember the memory song. And I didn't re- I remember magical Mr. Mistopheles. Mm-hmm. Uh, but <laughs> I got a funny story about that song. <laughs> but, uh, <Yeah. laughs> so uh, I remembered that, but I was like, ah, it's cats jumping around on stage. It's probably a love story going on and probably some good ballet and things like that. No, no. There's a, I feel like a Bookman where I was like, you would get this straight, Sonny boy. Like, uh, like, it, 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 there's nothing in this movie. This movie has no substance. This this play, this thing has no substance. It's a bunch of synthy 80s music <clears throat> with a bunch of famous people, except for the leads, weirdly enough, uh, that, that are running around in CGI cat suits. And it's and it's freaky. It's freaky. Now, the the the, the main ballerina, the 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 lead, the Victoria, the only one with an actual like normal name is uh, played by Francesca Haywood, Hayward. And not only is she a terrific ballerina, she's maybe one of the most attractive women I've ever seen. Mm. Even even as a cat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Especially as a cat. Around. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is they don't give her anything to do besides dance occasionally. Um, when she does dance, it's beautiful. Uh, but it's just freaky, man. Don't watch this movie. Don't be like me and say like, oh, I'm just going to hate watch it. No, just, just don't watch it. In fact, I told my wife that it was so bad. She was like, jokingly, she was like, why don't, uh, now I kind of want to watch it. I was like, no, you're taking all the wrong uh, theses from from this statement. Mm-hmm. I started singing because it's it gets stuck in your head. It's the, oh, well. I never have there ever a cat so clever as magical <laughs> Mr. Mistopheles. <laughs> and they sing it over and over and over again. Oh, well, I never was there ever a cat so clever as magical <laughs> Mr. Mistopheles. <laughs> and I started singing this in bed. And my wife started saying, don't sing it. I can't get it in my head. I can't. Uh, and uh, mm-hmm. so I stopped. Uh-huh. But Jesus yeah. Christ, this movie's bad. I cannot mm-hmm. warn it. Uh, my worn boner is so turgid that I want to <laughs> slap it across your face if you even think about watching this movie. Uh, see, that and... turns some people on. Mm-hmm. According to porn. <laughs> yeah. Before, according to porn. <laughs> according to porn. I consulted went to, porn. I went, I went to the reference section and went to the porn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, this thing is terrible. It's so bad. Uh, <laughs> it's bad. Uh, Judy Dench is in there for a little bit, uh, actually for a long bit. Jason Derulo is in this with a British <laughs> accent for some reason. Taylor Swift is in there for about six seconds. Uh, Ray Winstone, Mr. French is in this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's just uh, top to bottom hideous. So yeah, I, I've watched it now, people, so that you didn't have to. And I hope you heed my warning and he- run far away. Eve Potts. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that boy. <laughs> it says it's, it's got its own orbit. That's it. I, I had a very bad day a week and a half ago, just bad luck wise, where I woke up and, and the two movies I hadn't seen with famous people in them uh, that were back to back on this channel I was on happened to be The Change Up. Mm, with yeah. Jason Bateman and Ryan oh, Gosling, yeah, 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 and Collateral Beauty with Will Smith and Kate Winslet. Now, the change up is a warn. I'm not even going to say another word about it. Don't ever watch. It. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. This is the one where they pee in the pool and body switch, right? Exactly. Yes. Okay. It's, you've already said too much. It doesn't deserve <laughs> even that. It doesn't even deserve to be. It's not funny at all. It's the opposite of funny. Oh my goodness! Yeah, I saw um, that. It sucked. Let's talk collateral beauty here for a second. Okay. This is one of the most emotionally manipulative movies I have ever seen. Mm. I saw through it, but it made me angry what this movie tries to do. So here's the plot. Will Smith has recently lost a child to a tragedy. Mm. He's also a big business honcho, but he's retreating from life 
He's not going to work anymore. He's not going out and hanging out with the friends anymore. Of course, he's very sad, right? Because his child is dead. <clears throat> his business partners are Kate Winslet, Michael Pena, and somebody fucking else. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> and they're, they're all assholes. Oh, it's Ed Norton. Um, <clears throat> fucking else. They're all assholes because it takes them very little time to decide we need to steal the company from him. Because he is not in the right state of mind. He's going to run the company into the ground. So we need to prove he's crazy. And then we'll get a judge to give the company to us. These are his fucking friends, by the way. Wow. And how do they they decide to do this? They hire three actors. You've got Kira Knightley, uh, Helen Mirren, and uh, Jacob Lattimore. I think it's Jacob Lattimore. They hire these three actors because in his aggrieved state, Will Smith's character has been writing letters to love, death, and time. God, this Mm -hmm. sounds fucking terrible As you you do. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They discover these letters, and they hire these actors to play love, death, and time to show up. And talk to him about the letters that he wrote to them. And they will film him surreptitiously. And then, without ever explaining any of this, edit out entire people, the actors. So it looks like Will Smith is talking to no one, even (laughs) though he is greatly agitated. This seems like a very convoluted plan. No fucking shit. (laughs) Uh, There's even one moment on a subway where the person filming is filming... Will Smith with his back to them and the actor is on the other side of Will Smith. (laughs) Cannot digitally remove in this instance, a person on a cell phone. (laughs) Anyway, so early on in the movie, he goes to this, uh, you've lost a child grief group. Those are real things. I'm not trying to make fun of that. I don't remember what it's called. Um, I hate this movie. This movie is trying to play on that kind of shit. So I'm not going to give this movie the time of day. Um, He goes to this group and and goes inside. And the the girl who's leading the group welcomes him. Asks if he wants to share. He shakes his head no. And then they're leaving. Uh, the meeting is over. And outside, she runs up to catch up to him and says, I've seen you lurking out there several weeks. Why did you choose tonight to come in? And he doesn't know. Uh, <clears throat> so she decides that she's going to try and help him out of her shell, out of his shell, and get back to life and grieve properly and, and move on. And he keeps coming to these meetings, and she keeps talking to him afterwards. And there's like this hint that maybe they'll date in the future or what have you. She lost her own child. She, her, her child's name was, oh, fuck it, it's important, but I don't remember what it was. Olivia. <laughs> um, she lost her to a disease and um, her husband moved out after it happened and said, I can't even look at you anymore. It'd been better if we'd never met. <clears throat> anyway, he continues to have these interactions with actors who are playing love, death, and time who are being filmed by a private investigator that looks like a shopping clerk. And uh, then we have this big law meeting where they drag Will Smith in. And they show these videos of him talking to no one and getting really agitated. And of course he believes he was talking to love, death and time. So he's not, he doesn't think anything's been edited, but he realizes my friends are fucking me over. And he's like, you know what? He gets teary-eyed. You can tell he really wanted to do some acting here. It's teary-eyed. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is okay. It's okay, guys. I understand why you're doing this. is the right thing. And he signs the paper to hand over the company to them. And he goes <clears throat> and knocks on a door. And the woman who leads the grief group opens the door. And he says, I hope you don't mind if I, I, I stop by. You, you're alone. It's Christmas Eve. And she said, I'm alone by choice. I was just watching a video of my former husband uh, dancing with my daughter, Olivia. Come on in. And he reluctantly goes inside. And she says, would you like to watch the video with me? And he says, no. And she turns on the video and he hears the noises and turns around. And it's him in the video. 
<laughs> and Olivia was his daughter. <laughs> and the woman who runs the grief counseling thing was his wife. And the note that said we should never have even met was something he wrote. And the movie is like, aha, cry, <laughs> fuck it, you manipulable <laughs> bull. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a sense of anything, you saw it coming ages ago. And then we see them walking a few days later, hand in hand through Central Park, and we pan up and we see the actors who played love and death and time watching them walk through the park. And he turns around and they're not there because they really were love, death, and time all along. And somehow managed to get hired to play themselves by the <laughs> What the friend. fuck is this fucking movie? I I'm, am I, so angry. This is a recommend, right? <laughs> this is a warn your fucking ass off. I think I have two <laughs> copies of this movie somehow. Oh my fucking, you should burn them. I am, <laughs> that's like a serenity type reveal. <laughs> like, I went to... I think I went to Best Buy and I was like, yeah, who knows? We may do this one day. I don't know. Oh. It. And I, I bought it. And then like, I probably like two weeks later, I was like, I don't know. Hey, collateral beauty. <laughs> he oh. just bought it again. Were they dead? How does he not recognize her and she doesn't recognize him? They do. They just he don't reco- tell the camera. It's trying to be like the sixth sets. No. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. Nothing. They actually say in the scenes gives away that they used to be together and that their daughter was one in the same which is uh, fucked up which is which is impossible which is impossible uh, i would oh, yeah. say oh yeah um like you like if you if you were to separate a married couple and then bring them back after 10 years or whatever and 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 just record them for five hours for whatever reason because you like to get your jollies off I don't know. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to pick out a minute worth of stuff that makes it look like they don't know each other. No. And she even does like the first meeting. She's like, my daughter's name was Olivia. She died of this disease. Would you like to tell us your daughter's name? (laughs) And he just shakes his head. No, like they can Mm -hmm. go out of their way. Like there's maybe there's like grief counseling rules that you can't let the other grievers know that you're secretly married or something. I don't know. Like this movie, all the only reason it does that is so that it can rip the rug out from under you at the end and make you cry. Mm -hmm. And it is so manipulative. I guarantee you, this is where it all started. The idea was right there. Boom. We're going to make them cry with that reveal. It was the same daughter all along. Now, how do I write backwards? And then Mm -hmm. let's just gloss over this whole thing about, abstract concepts being able to appear as humans and right. get hired as actors off the street and then appear and disappear at will and apparently no video editing was necessary because they actually weren't there the whole time i just the more i think about this movie the more i want to wring its neck it sounds like uh, like what a 12 year old would write right like <laughs> like uh well that doesn't make sense but who gives who, who cares that what we're gonna try to do is is make people cry at the end so i had this great reveal uh, like yeah. like they hire these actors and 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 oh how how terrible it is that his friends are doing this to him the hired actors to play love death and time and all this and then it turns out oh they were love death and time the whole time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, i'm appreciative that, that you made it all the way to the end i can't believe that you stuck around well, once I got, once I knew what I was watching, I hate watched. I was good. I knew I was going to talk about it on the podcast, and I can't bring it if I don't know what happens. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but also, at the first thirty minutes, the friends don't reveal themselves to be assholes. Will's doing a good job acting. You just think this is not terrible. And then once the friends start conspiring. And they hire the actors, and the actors are all like, oh, I don't know if I should do this. It feels manipulative, even though they're fucking sent by the universe, apparently, to (laughs) do exactly fucking that. Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's a wonderful life crossed with my life. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's a wonderful my life. (laughs) 
Why can't why can't they hire somebody to represent money, sex, and drugs? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, he didn't yeah. write letters to money, sex, and drugs. Uh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> there was money, sex, and drugs was still in the waiting room. Uh, I guess oh, if God. he had that's the sequel, is that yeah. he's gonna lose another kid, <laughs> yeah, and then he's gonna still, write letters. Yeah, this that's right. That's he's right. gonna lose to money, sex, <laughs> and plays drugs. the wife, by the way. Uh, a very attractive, good actress that I had not seen many times before. I don't know. Interesting, because there's a lot of famous people in this. Uh, there are. Um, did I mention one of the <laughs> assholes was played by, played <laughs> like, by Ed Norton? Wh- whoever the fuck. Ah, it's Ed Norton. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll tell you. Hang on one sec. Is it Just... Naomi Harris? Yes. Oh, oh from uh, 28 Days Later. Yeah, and, and she also played in... Um, uh, the uh, the recent giant James Bond movies and Pirates of the Caribbean and stuff like that. Yeah, she's good. Mm-hmm. All right, everybody, it is time to talk about better help. Better help. Uh, okay. So the the motto when you go to the the main page is uh, you deserve to be happy. And that's kind of nice. Like it, you, you don't really think about being happy, right? You either are happy, like. When we came on, we were saying like, oh, I'm in a good mood or I'm in a bad mood, that kind of thing. Uh, It's weird to me, and this may sound weird, uh, to search for happiness. It either happens to me or it doesn't. Um, And so working on this type of thing with BetterHelp, with my counselor, who I matched with, her whole thing is like, what are you doing to try to make yourself happy? And I'm like, huh? Like, it's just a state of being. Does any of this make sense? Like it's a state of being that I I've, I've never really actively tried to work on. Is that is mm-hmm. am I the only one that does that? No, no. Okay, <laughs> okay. but uh, yeah. So so when you do that, you have to break it down into little components about like you know what what are you good at? What are you not good at? What do you want to work on? That kind of thing. And counseling specifically through BetterHelp uh, gives you very tangible goals to be able to get to that state of being able to work on your happiness instead of just saying like, well, hopefully, you know, uh, I get a stimulus check come in today or something like that. And that'll make me happy. Or hopefully, you know, the pizza place will be open. That'll make me happy. No, it's an internal thing. And I'm probably describing it very poorly, but it's, it's kind of just a, like a screws with my mind a little bit (laughs) to take on that angle. BetterHelp has helped me get there uh, in incremental ways. Not all the way there. I'm not happy all the time, like uh, 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 Kimmy Schmidt or, or that kind of thing. But- <laughs> I, was, I was hoping for something much better than Kimmy Schmidt. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm working on it, and BetterHelp is helping me with that. It's online professional counseling, all licensed uh, counselors, you sign up, go to betterhelp.com slash syncast, and you sign up, and uh, you get matched. You answer a few questions. You get matched with the counselor. Bada bing, bada boom, you're off and running, and it's just spectacular. A lot of people it. are scared of therapy, and I want to try and break it down for you, not in like a hip-hop rap kind of way. Can you please? Uh, can you can you rap what you're about to say? No, because I have okay. not pre-written it, uh, nor will it rhyme. Uh, <clears throat> but... <clears throat> Have you ever talked to somebody for a while, like a good friend, family member, um, had a, just a good talk, whether it was about current cultural stuff or feelings or what have you, and you get done, you're like, man, I feel great. Yeah. Right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Therapy is that with people that have been specifically trained how to help you work through the problems that you have inside your brain. Uh, talking to a friend can help you feel better. That's not therapy, but it's still good for you. Um, Mm -hmm. But people who are afraid of therapy view it more as talking to a friend who has professional expertise and that help draw out from you the ideas and concepts that will help you grow. And it's it's spectacular the way that they can do it. Now, I... (laughs) I was, I was trained in therapy. I know how to do this. I know how to do it on the, the other side, but yet I don't do that to myself. So she, my counselor can say something like, you know, are you practicing mindfulness? And I'm like, oh yeah, I was supposed to do that. Like, <laughs> how often are you getting out of the house? Oh, I was practicing oh, mindfulness. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I, I haven't left the house in like three days. Hmm, that's not good. I mean, uh, most therapists go to therapy. Um, yeah, in my yeah, yeah. experience, the ones that have been 
to have told me about it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just, I, th- I just think uh, it's not. <clears throat> It shouldn't be as scary as you might think. It's not somebody trying to shrink your brain or get inside your head. It's just somebody that knows how to help you talk through your issues and help you guide towards solutions. And it's awesome. And it's remote. People, you don't want to get out there it, with, with the people and the germies and, and the stuff traffic, like that. The traffic. Small. You want, to, you want to sit in the comfort of your own home. You want to talk to somebody uh, and and get some... You know, things off your chest. Uh, go to betterhelp.com, better H E L P dot com slash sincast. You know, we love it. You know, I love it. You know, uh, I've told you I've benefited from it. We've heard from other people who have benefited from it. It's fantastic. Go to betterhelp.com slash sincast to get 10% off your first month. That is not nothing, trust me, but definitely let them know uh, if you have any issues with payment. They are there to help. Betterhelp.com. Slash Sincast. Do it. <laughs> Another movie that I got recommended that I watched. This one's kind of fucked up. Oh, kind of fucked up. It'll 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 make you make you ponder about uh, about uh, about life and whatnot. Though uh, it is a movie called Womb. W O M B. Womb. It has Ava Green and it has Matt Smith of uh, Doctor Who fame. In huh. it. Um, and it's about these kids who, um, develop this relationship on like some beachfront property, uh, when they're like nine or 10 years old or whatever. And, um, it looks like they, they, they might be, they might be having their first love here and everything. And, uh, the, the, the kid, I think his name is Thomas, um, uh, is, uh, his family moves to Tokyo before anything like that can happen. So they've been separated and they grow up without each other or anything like that. So now that they're grown up, Ava green, it's like, I want to, I want to find, want to find this guy again. And, uh, she, she goes and, and, uh, searches around, asks his mom, mom played by Leslie Manville. Hmm. Um, uh-huh. and, uh, and uh asks his mom where uh, where where he's at and uh he goes she goes to the shack and finds him and it's like they never they never what's going on sorry she goes to a shack and finds him sorry <laughs> funny to me okay um and uh and uh and it's almost like they never they never stopped from where they were at 9 or 10 years old uh they're like immediately back sort of entranced with each other and everything and um and uh he we find out that he's an activist of some sort and he's planning on this uh this big thing where he's going to go to a uh some sort of lab or whatever and uh, unleash a whole bunch of cockroaches on this lab and uh and uh and she's she's going to go along with him and uh and uh on this on this trip on the drive there she's like she's got to pee or whatever she goes over starts walking over to wherever she's going to go pee and she hears a car smash into matt smith he's dead hmm Mm -hmm. but they live in a world huh that seems sudden it is sudden it's in the first 20 minutes of the movie okay Mm. um so uh, they live in a world of human cloning um Uh, and the way the cloning works in this movie is that you get the genetic material and you carry a baby to term and, and uh, you know, you give birth to the clone. Now they don't like become like, it's not like multiplicity where they're instantly Michael Keaton. These, these are, you know, these are people who are going to be babies and you have to raise them as babies and everything. Huh. Um. Ava Green goes to Leslie Manville and says, I'm thinking about cloning him. And, uh, and of course the parents, their parents are like, well, you know, we're atheists and we, we, uh, we raised him atheist and everything, but we don't want to have any part of this at all. Mm. And there is a stigma in, in, involved with people who are clones. They are derogatorily called copies and stuff like that. Um, in the movie. Um, uh, Ava Green has decided that she's going to carry this baby to term, um, which opens up a whole bunch of complex uh, issues, right? Because 
uh, she's giving birth to what is her son, but it's Dude. also somebody that is going to grow up to be the the man she fell in love with. Mm. Um, and watching this is, I mean, it's uncomfortable in a lot of ways because, uh, you, you try to, you know, you're trying to figure out exactly what is, you know, this new Thomas, who, who is he? Is he really Thomas? The one that she grew up falling in love with, or is it, is this her son? This is her son. Um, I think, I think probably most people will say, yeah, that's her son. That's never somebody that's going to be, you know, that ha- that can be her lover later on in life, uh, or anything, but it's obvious that she doesn't think of it that way. Um, and, and, and you can see the sort of the weird, uh, bind she's in, in this movie, because she's got a She's got to like uh, raise this kid and she's waiting for this guy to grow up essentially. Um, and he being in the meantime, he's, he's like has his own life. He's a different person. Um, and he even gets a girlfriend played by Hannah Murray from game of Thrones who played uh, uh, what's his name's girlfriend, the pregnant one. What was her name? Gilly played Gilly. Oh, um, Gilly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, uh, Watching Ava Green's performance in this movie is pretty devastating um, because you can see how depressed she is uh, in this whole thing. Um, you can see her sort of like, this is not what she had had planned during this whole thing. Um, but there are a lot of like fucked up moments in this movie too. Uh, some things that are going to make you go, mm-hmm about this at all that's the where the warn comes in um the recommend comes in from the fact that this is a really interesting movie that really makes you ask a lot of questions about the morals and ethics of what she's doing um and uh and so it is it is worth watching now i could not find this on any streaming service i had to buy this on a blu-ray so it may be one of these wreck of warns that I tell people to go watch and they will have to find it on their own. But um, if you can find it, I would recommend it. Just know that there's some things in that movie that are going to make you go, Ooh, I don't know about that. I imagine uh, the breastfeeding scenes are awkward once he's grown up. <laughs> I can't imagine so. <laughs> it's like the last emperor. Um, <laughs> that's an interesting concept though. I think yeah, it is. When we watch this. Totally. Yeah, no, it's it I I thought it was a really good movie. It's just that it it it's a, it's a tad fucked up and and uh but watch it cuz this is probably one of the best Ava Green performances I've ever seen. Well, um, good. Uh she's um yeah, she it just watching her sort of deteriorate in a way over the years. I mean, she's she's a good mom, quote unquote, um in this thing, but uh but uh, the the reasoning for her doing all of this obviously is is causing some damage over time. So anyway, I recommend it. Right. I've always uh, wondered uh, how good of an actress she was because she's so beautiful that she's cast in these very sexy roles and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Well, and she's in yeah, she's on the stupid shit like Dark Shadows and Miss mm-hmm. Peregrines and you know it's just it never really got to see it now where you really do kind of get to see her i, I thought she was fantastic in um in casino royale yeah yeah uh, even she though was. she is cast as a bond girl and the love interest and everything i thought she was awesome in that and she's great in the dreamers as well but yeah the, after that they just sort of made her like she's gonna be like evil chick in sin city or evil yeah. chick in 300 the sequel or <laughs> you know yeah and that's why because she is so good in casino royale that's why i kind of question like if she's got a little more range and mm-hmm. it's like she does yeah definitely mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you want to hear some more fucked up shit yeah okay. man i love fucked up shit all about it is it gonna be more uh, cats without buttholes no mm-hmm. uh this is hbo's the vow Okay. Wow. This is I the, have heard of this. <clears throat> this is the uh, Nexium cult. It's it's stylized as N X I V M, but it's pronounced as Nexium, like the acid reducer, like the or purple whatever. pill. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, 
Okay, so I don't know if you know uh, the background about the next team thing. It's uh, the 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 leader of this group is Keith Ranieri, and uh, it was famous for uh, getting charged with uh, uh, sex trafficking and racketeering and stuff like that, but also the involvement of Allison Mack, uh, who is an actor that uh, was in Smallville. I think mm-hmm. I've never watched Smallville, so she was. Um, She's she's apparently a big part of this whole. Uh, we'll call she it was a big cult. part of Smallville. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I love cult stuff, man. I I really do, and I'm not saying that uh, like uh, to be glib. Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> <laughs> I love watching stories about cults because it's it's fascinating to me uh, how one person usually a small, unattractive dude like David Koresh or Keith Ranieri or Jim Jones or something <laughs> like, like, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's just, I it's you somebody that, name and like an actor that was in a movie, like a small and attractive guy, like Walton Goggins <laughs> <laughs> uh, or even L Ron Hubbard, you know, can, can take over uh, somebody's life. And that's what they, the, this guy has done. He built, you know, he and his, compatriot uh a, a woman named uh forget her name uh but she, they basically built this cult out of him being la- lauded as a guy that's figured life out that's figured emotions out that's figured all this stuff out and weirdly they have a ton of footage of this um because i think he wanted to hobnob with celebrities uh hence the allison mack stuff uh sarah edmondson uh who had been in a bunch of stuff um, he recruited her. Uh, it, it's just, it's just so weird. So, okay. Interesting subject matter. Very interesting. He fucks all of them, by the way. Uh, mm. Mm. they, they, when you move up to a certain level, they have this thing called DOS, which is a women's group. And the, one of the goals or one of the requirements is to sleep with, uh, with, uh, with this guy. Okay. Uh, once again, I'm fascinated by cult leaders who are, so uh, highly thought of that all the women in the the cult sleep with them. Charles Manson, like uh, like this guy, uh, David Koresh had the harem and stuff like that. It's just bizarre to me. The problem with this this documentary is that it makes this, this sounds pretty interesting, right? Sex cult and uh, famous people and stuff like that. It's boring. It's boring. It's stretched out over nine episodes. They're going to have a second season, and it just lingers way too long. You told me, Jeremy, when you watched that Michael Jackson documentary, he said that it was like 60% drone footage of neighborhoods and stuff like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's what this is. It could have been distilled down into maybe three or four episodes or something they like that. They just ordered a second compelling. season of this I know, thing. I know, I know. And uh, apparently it doesn't get into – the actual Keith Ranieri uh, story. It just, mm. it, maybe it does later on. I've watched four episodes of this and I'm, I'm going to finish it because like I said, it's interesting subject matter, but it's, it's just so strong out uh, that that's where the warn comes in. Anybody else that's seen this, get on the comments and talk to me about this and see if you have the same feeling. My wife had the same feeling. Uh, so yeah, it's HBO. So, you know, it's like high quality, but just goose it a little bit, you know, give me, give me, it's already a compelling story. Just give me a little bit. You know what I mean? Mm, yeah. yeah. Anyway. It sounds like it might've been better as a documentary as opposed to a doc, a series. Yeah. Yeah. Well, especially nine episodes and then a second season. Jeez. Uh, it's, it's just not, they keep following everybody. So the, the whole thing is presented by people who have uh, extracted themselves uh, from, from the cult and they're exposing what was going on in there. And it's like, okay, all right, yeah, he's a bad dude. He's oh, okay, he's recruiting women to have sex with him. Okay, okay, we got it. Let's move on. So anyway, the vow on HBO, wreck and warn. Uh, there's a lot to like there. I mean, as much as you can like uh, a cult uh, that actually happened, um, but uh, it's it's a little it's a little long winded. All right, it's all right. I got. I'm sorry. I did saw the. I saw that. I remember that news story back in the day with Allison Mack showing up. It was what, how many years ago? Two or three years ago, maybe. Yeah, yeah. 2017, I think. Yeah, yeah. I remember seeing it because I didn't know who she was. I didn't watch Smallville, but uh, Kristen Kruk was also uh, recruited into that, but she yep. left it uh, like soon after or whatever. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, uh, so a lot of those Smallville uh, actors were, were recruited and all that thing. But anyway. And uh, Catherine Oxenberg, uh, who was on Dynasty, uh, her daughter got recruited into it and was a super high level member and all that stuff. So she's featured in it trying to get her daughter out of it mm. uh, quite a bit. So like I'm saying, this is really, really compelling. I just uh, yeah. uh, put the gas a little bit. Yeah, Hit yeah, the yeah. Gas. <laughs> I got a record. Oh no! Uh, the current war. <clears throat> uh, oh, is this the, the electricity people? <laughs> yes, the electricity people. I remember, I remember us talking about this, and you were down on it before it even came out, right? <laughs> Only because it had it was made in 2017, and it right. was perpetually pushed back. Although mm-hmm. I think the internet said there was a reason. Uh, there's not a reason. Um, it, it was the Weinstein thing. That's what uh, what Chris had. Uh, well, that might have been the reason, but that did, that's not the reason. It's not good. Um, <laughs> this is okay. So uh, on on the teleguide, when I'm flipping channels, it actually calls it the current war director's cut. Oh, okay. Which is part of, I think. That's probably part of the story of why it didn't come out earlier, I have to believe. This has great actors. Tom Holland is in this. Uh, Cumberbatch is in this. Uh, Michael Shannon. 8 Mile is in it. Shannon. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nicholas Holt. <laughs> Nicholas Holt is playing. All the fucking movies Michael Shannon has done. Okay. You're okay. going to um, throw out 8 Mile. <laughs> so, so Cumberbatch is playing Edison. Uh, Shannon is playing Westinghouse and Nicholas Holt is playing Tesla. Have you seen white Christmas? Yeah. Yeah. Like at least once, like it opens in, in the war and, and Danny Kaye saves, uh, Bing Crosby from a falling wall. Right. And gets his arm busted up in the war and then comes to visit him in the hospital. And they're like, Hey, maybe we'll get together and do a song after the war. I'm an entertainer. And, and, and Bing Crosby's character is already a famous entertainer before the war. Hmm. And then we get a montage after the war and it's literal bits of them dancing on stage. Hey, hey, woo-hoo, yeah. And then it'll be like a flashing <laughs> newspaper. Dewey defeats Truman or whatever. Um, <laughs> and then it'll be the, them on another stage, blue skies, smiling. And there'll be another newspaper. Uh, Wallace sells out the Wallace and Davis sell out the Apollo or whatever. Um, and you get like three minutes of 10 years of their career that is condensed down so that you realize by the end of it, they're massive stars, their gimmick worked, they're bigger as a pair than he ever was as a solo, and then we start the movie. The current mm. war is all montage. Mm. It, mm. It's all Edison talking to reporters, saying something. He, hey, hey, did you hear what Westinghouse is doing? Newspaper, Dewey defeats Truman. There's a train going by. Steam is coming out of it. <laughs> no, Nicholas Holt is <laughs> talking to somebody. <laughs> it's happening <laughs> every, <laughs> every news cycle. <laughs> <laughs> the entire movie feel, plays like, because it's trying to cover like 40 years of basically electricity arch nemeses trying to one-up each other, it all ends up feeling like a montage where every scene, instead of a scene, it feels like a stop-off for a few seconds in the montage before we get back on the train. And the only reason there's any wrecka to my yawning warn is that I feel like the performances are good. I feel like the good actors do good acting. Uh, But there's very little in the way of a story that makes sense. It's, it should, this is one of these that should have been a miniseries instead of a movie. You're trying to tell too much story about too many people um and it just it's just there's not enough of any of it it's like going to one of those restaurants that literally serves everything spaghetti burger (laughs) chicken fingers we got it omelet we got it none of that shit's going to be good because they're not a specialty at any of it uh and that's what it ends up i was i was bored i didn't even finish it i watched an hour of it and i was done and and there you go i would not i would not spend your time on it unless you just love one of those actors and want to see something they're in because they're all good in it Mm mm-hmm how was uh, Nicholas Holt as Tesla? Awesome, but he's not. I was. He's he's trained me now to expect like this like wild glint in his eye, Nicholas Holt from like the favorite and whatnot. Yeah, 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 and yeah. playing Tesla, I expected some kind of. He just plays him like a dude. He's good. Oh, really? I oh. think I think it's Michael Shannon, David Bowie, the best <laughs> acting. 
Um, Cause even Cumberbatch is saddled with the fact that Edison was a prick. And so <laughs> he can't be likable in any of his scenes cause he's yeah. doing pricky things. <clears throat> yeah. And Tom Holland is like the, the kid that's interviewing them. Right? Yeah. He's like some British in fact that I was watching the movie and he spoke and I said, why is he speaking with an English accent when everybody else that's British is speaking American? And I looked him up and he's playing a British guy who was just involved. It was like a, uh, he's writing a memoir about Edison, I think, or a, a, a biography or something. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Anyway, yeah. there you go. <clears throat> I right. was uh, curious about that, actually. I thought that was going to be decent, but mm, well, that's why I watched it. <clears throat> there you go. Uh, we ready for some questions? Yeah. Question. Question. I got something to say. I am listening. Uh, I think at least Barrett is. Yeah, man. Damn. I can't wait. I like this first one. This first one's my favorite. What is your favorite use of diegetic music in a non-musical film? Parenthesis. Diegetic meaning the music plays in the world of the narrative and is heard or sung by the characters as opposed to being added in by the editors. Makes sense? We It makes sense to us. Mm-hmm. Listeners. Okay. A couple of... This person's favorites, uh, for example, Adam Driver singing Being Alive in Marriage Story. Cannot agree harder about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Michael Sarah and Ellen Page singing Anyone Else But You in Juno. Love mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. That's, uh, that's by a group that uh, I used to listen to all the time, a duo. Uh, name escapes me, but it's uh, it's hilarious. They anyway. had to take five years off after they wrote that song. They were so emotionally drained. <laughs> 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 anyway diegetic music what do you guys think um, so the first thing that came to my mind was the uh wise up uh from magnolia Ooh, uh, nice. where everybody is in their like various states of uh uh whatever they're at in uh in that movie most most of them are not having a good time at the time that they sing <laughs> i love that part especially when john c Riley is like wise up on the money wise up i know it's memorable it's it's crazy and then davi <laughs> digg shows up and it's really great um oh, but so uh great scene. but yeah wise up is the amy, amy man did the whole soundtrack for that movie mm-hmm. um uh and and her her, her, husband, her husband michael penn scored it um but uh but uh wise up is a is a cool thing because everybody's singing this song and they're all just you know somebody's in their car somebody's you know in their house somebody you know it's all at the same time magnolia of course one of the most pretentious movies ever but i love it uh and uh <laughs> and and this is one of those scenes um uh it seems like old times diane keaton and annie hall uh oh. is a uh, is a uh, is a nice thing and then i love the karaoke scene in lost in translation what's oh. so funny about peace love and understanding and brass and pocket uh bill yeah. bill murray and scarlett johansson uh there, there's a moment when that movie really like officially involves me and that's that part right there it's because that's when they're officially starting to kind of like feel something uh for one each for each other we don't know what that really is yet or ever really in that movie but that's where they seem to be getting close is is right there well you um, also there's a third component to that scene it's the uh, more than this uh, yeah uh, yeah kind of this i love the way he sings that fucking song i love that mm-hmm. song mm-hmm. but it's where everybody is just kind of calmed down it's you know the the uh the 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 fun is dying down but he's got the microphone and he's just like more than this. And he's really yeah. like singing the lyrics of the song. He's looking straight at her mm-hmm. and she is just a puddle. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bad way to, I, I, you know, I knew what you meant. It didn't have anything to do with what you were saying yeah. there, but yeah. people are going to take it that way. She, uh, she melts in front of him when mm-hmm. she does it. I, and it, it's just, it's a, it's one of the most, like even when they're in bed and stuff like that, it, it's like the closest that you see them is when he's singing that more than this song. That's mm-hmm. a great example. Yeah, yeah. Good call. Good call. Um, me, me, yeah, mm-hmm. me. I love this question. I think we should make this question a recurring segment. It's so good. Um, mm-hmm. the first thing I thought of was when Uncle Junior on The Sopranos stands up in the restaurant after the funeral and sings. Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> 
because most people, myself at the time included, did not know the actor was an incredible singer yeah. uh, and was like musically trained. Um, and I'm going to find the link and send it to you guys so that you can at least hear it if you haven't or don't remember. Wait, you've never seen The Sopranos, right? No, it's The Wire I've never seen. I've seen all oh, okay. of The Sopranos. Yeah. Uh, do you remember this scene? Uh, I because did, I got I chills. Because I didn't, I didn't. First of all, I didn't know they were going to let him go for as long as he did, and I didn't know he was going to be that good. Yeah. Um, and then the other ones I wrote down is Tom Hanks and Paul Newman doing the piano duet in Road to Perdition. Mm-hmm. Um, That's great. It starts out so harmless, but it serves such an important purpose once it cuts to that view of Daniel Craig watching, being like, "I am never going to be this dude's son, man. He is never going to love me as much as he loves that fucker." Um, <laughs> and he's, isn't that where he does the? He starts laughing. And he he tells the kid because it's so it fucking hilarious or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the song that Scarlett Johansson's character makes up in the movie Her. Yeah. Um, oh, nice, nice. Which is a very fun little melody. And then the last thing I wrote was the French singing in both the Breaking Bad episode uh, and uh, Broadcast News, uh, where Albert mm. Brooks is singing in French instead of watching the news that he's not a part of on this special report. And he's like, <laughs> he's singing the real words, not the gibberish. And yeah. there's an opening of a Breaking Bad episode that starts with, uh, is it Gail? Gail. Yeah. Um, like watering his plants, uh, listening to some like, I'm, I'm getting pretty close, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and he knows all the words to that, too. And both of those scenes always are connected in my mind uh, because of how obscure the song is and how their perfect knowledge of it just adds charm to their character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Nice. Good calls. Some yeah, yeah, I got calls. some good ones. Uh, one of my favorites and the one that immediately sprang to mind is the end of High Fidelity. Because you've you've set up Jack Black, uh, his character Barry, uh, to be just this oaf and this guy that doesn't have any clue of what's going on or anything like that. That overestimates what he can do. The guy hilariously comes into the record shop after seeing the the uh, help wanted for a band sign, and he's like, "Well, you you need somebody to play guitar?" And he's like, "Yeah." And he's like, "Cool, I'll do it." And he's like, "Yeah." Cool. And he walks out and he like puts his fist up. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so you think he's a buffoon, but then uh, it, it, he somehow gets booked to play uh, uh, John Cusack's return to DJing and everything. And he's all like nervous about it. He's like, I can't, I can't believe I got Barry to do this. And he comes out and uh, sings uh, Marvin Gaye's Let's Get It On and fucking kills it. Of course, Everybody now knows that Jack Black has a terrific voice as part of Tenacious D. Uh, he just uses it to humorous effect. But mm-hmm. when he's like, I've been feeling how, baby. Uh, and it's it, everybody's in shock, especially Rob, uh, John Cusack's character. For some reason, what sticks in my mind is that as soon as he gets over his initial shock, he starts putting his hands up in the air and dancing with his girl. And it looks stupid. And I hate that part of it. But I love when Barry comes out. And sings. I've got a few more. Okay. It's, it's very weird. Uh, I love, and speaking of crazy Italian uncles, I love the scene in The Godfather where uh, they get in the, it's the wedding scene. It goes on for so long. It's so glorious. It's the wedding scene. And, and so they're doing this, this Italian kind of uh, ditty. And they're like, hey, Uncle Junior. I don't know what he's called. Uncle whatever. Uh, Papino, get, get up here and, and sing, and uh, everybody's delighted. And he's like, "No, no, 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 no!" But then he gets up there and he's like, <laughs> and then like every once a like, uh, he's like but a boom, but a ding, and everybody's like, oh! <laughs> super fun. It's super fun. I'll tell you what I love uh, about that movie. Uh, many things, but one thing I love is the character that uh, the actress that plays the mom is one of the most beautiful women, even at her age, I know that's, that's ageist, but uh, she's just beautiful, warm. She barely gets any lines in the first or second movie, uh, but she's terrific. And the, her delight in seeing the uncle get up there and sing his bada booms and all that is just uh, lovely. So that's, mm. that's another one. I got more. Hang on. Uh, oh, uh, let's go to, uh, God damn it. Sue studio and American psycho. 
Gary Oldman conducting and remembering his childhood as Beethoven at the end of Immortal Beloved. In fact, you guys, it's a great movie. And what I wanted to get to is Arlene slash Butterfly's lap dance in Death Proof. Uh, mm. It's uh, way down in, in Mexico. Um, uh, at, uh, no, no, what is it? Uh, at a tonk, honky Tonk down in Mexico. Um, I forget the, the band that did it. But uh, it's sexy as hell, man. Uh, her, I, I forget the character, or the actress's name. Well, it's funny because she, uh, she, she initially they're out there talking and smoking and stuff like that with stuntman Mike. Uh, and it's he's uh, like, v- Vanessa Ferlito. That's who. That's who her name is. Yes. Uh, and uh, he's basically daring her. He's like, "How about that lap dance?" And she's like, "You know what? I don't want to do it." Her friends are saying she doesn't want to do it. And then somehow he gets through to her and it's not, you know, coercive or anything like that. It's she really wants to. And he just calls her chicken. <laughs> he calls her chicken. Yeah. And uh, it, it's it's just it's just uh, it's pretty great. <laughs> it's it's incredibly great. And she's having a good time. He's having a good time. Everybody's having a good time. Yeah, the 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 way it shot, like uh, it looks like uh, Tarantino just cleared out the bar and put the camera straight down in the middle, and like you know, it's 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 got this wide, you know, like big look to it and everything. Yeah. But uh, yeah, she that that scene is fantastic. I downloaded that song. I love that song so much. That song, well, just like every other Tarantino movie, he's perfect at doing that music supervision that 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 background like uh harmony that ah, yeah, yeah. Bops you up. Yeah. <laughs> i love that shit uh you want to do one more let's do one more come on come um, on oh, i said all right the coasters it's the coasters version that that's on uh, i should have remembered that let me, let me make sure because i i actually downloaded one one of the songs and it wasn't the right one it had the same name You've seen Death Proof, Jeremy, right? Mm-hmm. Do you remember this scene? Mm-hmm. Uh, did you like oh, it? Oh, yeah. I mean, both of them are the coasters, but one of them just wasn't that same. It wasn't that one. Um, mm-hmm. I can't even remember how the other one goes, but anyway, yeah, yeah. coasters. Hey, speaking of sexy, let's get yeah. sexy. All right. I like okay. this question on a, on a purely intellectual level. <laughs> yes. What movies best use sex scenes to tell their stories? A great example is A History of Violence, in which the sex scenes show how great the marriage is, yes, with the cheerleaders and the whatnot, uh, and later how much the marriage has fallen over the course of the movie. Mm. What do you guys think? You know, this isn't my answer, but one of the things that came up, mainly because the uh, you know the apolo- apologists for showgirls would say this, is that the sex scenes and showgirls are important because they like even the crazy one in the pool because <laughs> it's a transactional sex scene. It's yes, not it has nothing to do with being sexy at all. Um, <laughs> she makes him ejaculate in the strip club. Like yeah, that. yeah, I know. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> that movie. Um, but the one that I thought, and I, I was I was trying to think of it because in the terms that he's talking about here, or the the questioner is talking about here, uh, that's a great one for history of violence. I could not think of anything similar to that, but I started thinking about uh, sex scenes that are important to the story and everything. And the Terminator has a an important oh, sex scene. Yes, it and does. <laughs> if it's if that is not shown, then then none of it doesn't make sense. Now depends on what you, I mean, when I first saw Terminator, I don't know, I was probably like what, 15 or 16 when I saw it. Um, I probably thought that was like gratuitous in some way. I mean, you know, what, what's the point and everything, especially the, the, the lead up to it is so fucking ridiculous because he, he's like, he, he tells Linda Hamilton, he's like, I was in the future and I looked at this picture and I fell in love with you and blah, blah, blah. And then he's like mad at himself for, for leak for saying that he goes over and he starts shoving that dynamite in the fucking like bag. He's just like, God damn it. Why did I, why did I put my fucking heart on the table like that? Keep that shit alive. And then she goes over and says, it's okay. Hey, I want, I want this too. Um, and, uh, and, and so, yeah, like if you, if you told the story of the Terminator, you wouldn't be able to tell the story without that sex scene at all. Um, it depends on whether or not you think it's gratuitous with nudity and shit like that. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, I don't, 
Eh, no. I don't know. I don't. I, I request nudity, in fact. Yeah. But, uh, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You look like. You look like. <laughs> like uh, Buffalo. You look like Buffalo Bill and stuff. Yeah, yeah, he does. Um, yeah, he, he, he really does make it look like, like Steve Carell was right. Bags of sand, man. Uh, but no, uh, yeah, you, you, you can't, uh, you know, John Connor doesn't exist if, uh, Kyle That's Reese right. and Sarah Connor don't knock boots. That's right. All right. That's a good call. I accidentally picked two Amy smart movies and oh. they both qualify as answers to this question. They do. The first is road trip. Yeah. Where he has sex with Amy smart on video and accidentally mails that sex tape to his girlfriend across country, thus necessitating the titular road trip. (laughs) (laughs) There would be no movie if there was no sex scene. Uh, Similarly, in the movie (laughs) Crank, uh, uh, Jason Statham has been, I guess, implanted with this device that will... He has to keep his heart rate up all the time or he's going to die, mm-hmm. is the point. And then there is a point where basically the only good option for keeping his heart rate up is to have sex with Amy Smart. I'm pretty sure it's in the street in front of a, middle pe- a bunch yes. of people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, no, there's no rest of the movie if they don't have sex right there and save his life. Uh, the movie ends, right? That he yeah. dies. It's right. called the transport. Or not the transport. It's called the, it's called the crank. <laughs> crank. Not called crank. It's just called crank. Because it's not a full movie. <laughs> In crank I, uh, high voltage, they fuck on a like a horse racing track. They do. They well, yeah. They I think they do it in every crank movie, right? I mean, <laughs> well, there's two. There's two crank movies. Oh, I thought there was three. There, um, might, there might be more. I don't know. But the, the, the crank two, yeah. He goes to a race race track and they fuck out there in the fucking yeah on like the race track on the rail. Yeah, my favorite uh, part in that in that first one is where like he's hitting her from behind and the crowd's like yeah and he like raises his <laughs> yeah yeah. Yeah. Ah, oh, movie's bonkers fun. <clears throat> oh, shit. Go. I've got a bunch. What, what, I do want to do one that's completely on point with uh, this questioner's uh, question. Um, Wolf of Wall Street is very much like that. Uh, Leo and Margot Robbie, the first time that they have sex, he's a big shot. And he's say, uh, this is how awesome I am. And he ejaculates within like 30 seconds or something like that. So you can tell, you know, it's style over substance. Then later on in the movie, uh, they're they're having sex and he's trying to seduce her and stuff like that. And she gets to a point where you know she's not into it, but she's like encouraging. She's like, oh, can, can he come for me? Can he come for me? And he does. And she's like, I want a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> so that shows that. I do want to shout. Okay, so Out of Sight has one of the, the best filmed sex scenes that shows no sex but is very, very important to the rest of that movie. If they don't have that interaction where they take a break, um, they can't really have that connection at the end where, you know, he gives himself up and she you know, does him. what she does. Uh, so out of sight is the one that immediately came to my mind. <clears throat> um, uh, the other one is stealing beauty. Uh, oh. Stealing beauty is the, when you, when you boil it down, it's the hunt for, uh, Liv Tyler's uh, character, her father, but also to lose her virginity. Yeah, it's uh, the female version of losing it. Every <laughs> everybody in this village is obsessed with her losing her virginity. Jeremy's iron keeps asking. He's like, "Did you did you pop your cherry yet?" Or you know stuff like that. And uh, and, and so does Rachel Vice and like everybody. Uh, she finally gets the the delivery boy Osvaldo uh, uh, to. Uh, to, to make out with her after she's spurned by the uh, other object of her affection. And when they do have sex, it's set to Portishead's glory box mm. and on the nose metaphors aside, it's <laughs> sexy as hell. It's awesome. <laughs> They're in this like Italian vineyard and boom, boom, like the, the, the Portishead stuff and God <laughs> It's so good. And then he's like, can you help me put it in? Yeah. Bernardo Bertolucci, man. He has this fascination with people having sex for the first time. It did it in Dreamers as well, where he's like, will you help me? You got to help me with this. Guy, oh my cock. 
You know, a guy, we must guide his cock. We can't block his cock. I want to throw out one more that I appreciate as a married person uh, in tag. There's a a scene where Isla Fisher has now become obsessed with tagging uh, Jeremy Renner. And she's like, cover all the exits, this, 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 this. And uh, Ed Helms, her husband in the movie, is like, you're, it's like you're speaking a foreign language to me. Like, I don't even know who you are. And she drops into this French coquettish voice of like, am I from a different country? Is this, I forget, Claudette or something like that? Oh, you want Claudette God. to come out? And you can tell they've role played this many, many times before. And it gets him immediately on it. Mm-hmm. And she's like, all right, we only have five minutes. Let's go to the bathroom. <laughs> But they're insta horny. <laughs> uh, I know what that is. It's not Claudette, but he even says like, "Oh, is she here? You brought her here." <laughs> <laughs> Whatever her name is, is Chantel. She... I think it's Chantel. Chantel? Hey, would you like to see her? That's awesome. That whole scene. You, you, you want to watch that movie? Uh, for many reasons, because it's funny, but that whole reset or not reception, uh, the rehearsal dinner scene is my favorite part. That's where, uh, dude gets drunk. Uh, Hannibal Burris gets drunk. And How many John- wines have you had? How many legs does an octopus have? Well, eight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good. It's so awesome. There's somebody, I think. I don't know if it was by choice or what, but Isla Fisher, I feel like, should have been a much bigger star mm-hmm. over her career uh, when uh, she she sort of came on the scene with Wedding Crashers. And uh, I thought she was just outstanding in that movie. She was. And everything, everything she's been in since, she's just shown how, how, how funny she is all the time and just great all around and and like she's never become that big name, never. Mm-hmm. She's mm-hmm. a. I saw her in uh, Hot Rod. Uh, I, I had to watch Hot Rod over the weekend. Um, and just she's just she's just really just she's charming. She's very charming. She is. She is, um, and she's married to Sasha Baron Cohen. Yep, yep mm-hmm. she is. Um, all right. Well, that's going to do it for this week. Uh, keep going to Syncast presented by Cinema Sins on Facebook. We're also on Cinema Sins Twitter, Music Video Sins Twitter. Uh, Discord. If you want to get on Discord, you can go to the Reddit page on the right side and find the link, or you can go to Facebook and private message me, and I'll give you a link there. We're also on SoundCloud. Uh, that's going to do it for this week. Chris Atkins and Jeremy Scott and Barrett Share. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Comment on our episodes on our SoundCloud page. Check us out on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit. And be sure to visit cinemasins.com. I've already answered this goddamn question. Yes, I, I'm in such a great mood today, and it feels like Chris is not, and that might make for interesting content. <laughs> That's oh. a great episode, though, man, because he comes back and he's like fashioned his entire thing out to where he's got like this much room between like his bar mm-hmm. and, and the thing. <laughs> and he's funny. George starts yelling at him, and he's like, "Why are you upset?" And he's like, "I don't know. These cabinets are making me very anxious." <laughs> <laughs> they, they they cheated and they use that same plot line again later when Jerry's agent, uh, the mom oh, yeah. from '70s show, yeah, uh, yeah. it's just too helpful. Like, just will you get me something to Only drink? Okay, okay, okay with that. Do you want water? Do you want soft drink? Do you want coffee? I'll take water. Okay, do you want it over ice? Do you want it chilled? Do you want it room temperature? He's like, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where she's like, I guess the the pilot of the airplane is in his show, and she's like, I don't want you to freak out, but the pilot is in the audience, and he's like, Why would I freak out about that? But the pilot doesn't laugh, so now he's like all freaked out when he gets on the plane and he sees the pilot. He's like, I'm freaking out. It's the same episode also where he's trying to get back to the model at the yeah. local airport and when he's making out with her at the end the fucking pilot's going by in a plane it's <laughs> <laughs> also isn't that also the one where kramer and the the yep. texans start betting yep yep oh my god episode. Mm-hmm. he's like no i've, I've, I've got a problem <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Kramer's backstory that's never explained, like him having a gambling addiction. 
He has like some of the funniest shit ever. <laughs> he's, he's over it by the time we actually meet him. Yeah. I'm going to answer you by doing this. <laughs> You're whacking Rolling yourself dice? off. Which is to say, I don't really care. <laughs> yeah, let's do. Um, let's he's do doing better. the dice dance again. <laughs> the Rufik, that's the only movie he's got. Uh, other than getting absolutely fucking mind wasted on Sunday night and having that carry over uh, on, onto Monday and being sick, basically. Oh, God. From it. Um, oh, that's a lot of whiskey, my friend. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> After the first glass, I was like, I should probably not do so much. And I drank this. You know how I am, man. I mean, I did the fucking edibles the same way. The uh, <laughs> I drank that second, drink that second glass. And I was like, God damn, man. Uh, Braves are ahead. But I had this. I just I knew they weren't going to win that game. It, <laughs> even though they were ahead, I Ooh. knew they weren't going to win. Because of the way things were going, you can always tell the plot yeah. of the yep. game. It doesn't matter if you're ahead or not. You can just see it happening where you're going to lose it. And um, I was like, I'll have one more. And uh, and uh, that you know, I was comp- I'm just I was out of my fucking mind after that. <laughs> that third glass was just. Just, well, you I were mean, pouring it all the way. It was like a milk glass. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, it wasn't that. It wasn't that big. <laughs> but okay, seriously, is this some kind of special whiskey? Because I don't think I'd ever heard of it. It's Woodford Reserve. It's like my favorite bourbon. I think. Yeah, it's a Kentucky. It's, isn't it a Kentucky bourbon? Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, is bourbon whiskey? Yes. And it bourbon and it, is a sorry. Well, and it tastes great too. Yes, it's, it does. Not, it's not like it's not like your typical whiskey where you drink it and you're like, oh, like, there's a burn. Know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, there's a, I mean, there's a. This is very smooth. Uh, mm-hmm. The bottle looks awesome. It's, and when it says double oaked, I have no idea what that means, but I know it goes <laughs> down my throat nice. And, uh, and uh, double oaked. And uh, but it just, you know, you're like, you take it. Oh yeah, that double oak. I can, I can, <laughs> Can taste that makes it. it musky um but uh but yeah i mean it that first glass was enough to get me like i was i was a little i was already past buzzed on that first one and then i, I you know i don't know i was stupid i drank two more hey, um, do it. <laughs> i did i missed the slack in real time but going through that the next day was hilarious <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Drinking makes him play better. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. The uh, the uh, t- Rod and Todd uh, uh, Iron helps us play. Iron helps us play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then at the end, I'm sorry to in the your pain, but in the sheets. <laughs> <laughs> you were like, I'm sad and drunk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. It, was very, I was. it was poetic it was very poetic it was man i was i was uh, that clay bellinger home run i was like oh, oh. <laughs> god man i i couldn't this is how gross is this i don't know um i could not make myself vomit uh-huh uh, i was yeah. trying to yeah and i couldn't get it out what that mm-hmm. night yeah mm-hmm. and yeah, yeah. and 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 i gave up so i was like lying there just kind of just like if I could just get one of those just beautiful <laughs> spewy <laughs> no more I would be okay. <laughs> I told you all about the the time I, in college and I took that stupid dare that you can't drink a gallon of milk in an hour, right? Oh no! no. Did you do this at all? It was two me I, and this I've other guy. That. I've seen that dare been done. Oh, uh, we were sophomores. We both no, we were freshmen. We both did it for like twenty bucks. If we succeeded, it was nothing. And I actually called a hospital before we did it and asked the ER doctor if it was possible. And he said, well, it all depends on how big your stomach is. Oh, God. <laughs> I was like, all right. And so we get near the end, and I've got like a half a glass left. And the other dude is outside puking. He loses. And I you know. that far into it? I can feel the fucking milk in my esophagus 
Like this, it mm. can't even fit in my stomach. But I don't want to puke. It looks so fucking gross and uncomfortable what he's doing out on the porch. Mm-hmm. And I know if I slam the rest of this milk, I will puke because it won't, there's nowhere for it to go. It, it, <laughs> it's going to go up a couple inches down and then it's all coming back up. So my smart ass just quits, dumps the milk no. out, goes to bed. It's literally spent maybe seven trips to the toilet over that n- night. I, I did not know at the time that I was lactose intolerant. That was all. No. Um, and uh, really, really dumb. But I was a college freshman. A lot of people do dumb shit when they're college freshmen. Mm-hmm. I actually, to be honest, I had I did even dumber shit. I'm not going to tell you about, but uh, <laughs> that one I will tell you about, if only to keep some uh, some other poor sap out there from trying that challenge. I am happy that we, uh, at least I w- was a generation removed from people who were doing butt chugging. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> did you ever see a, someone butt chug? Like I people are people do that. I you know, know what I'm talking about? That's one of those things that Jeremy won't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. (laughs) That's gonna somebody's gonna be on the fence and they're gonna hear that and they'll be like, okay. I'd rather I'd rather not. (laughs) I just throw people away with that last thing. I'm sorry. I'll I'll be more appropriate. Um, I love my job. I love my I love my get, dead gay son. <laughs> yes, your dead gay son. I yeah. love my get, dead gay son. Uh, yeah, that I mean, almost like, like a religious group. The gay days. <laughs> the <Ged> days. <laughs> Join the gay days. It's no different than the nibs of him. <laughs> well, I've been okay. entertaining my wife lately by doing an impression of the honking Canadian geese whenever they're in our backyard. Which is fun nice. because she'll be enjoying breakfast, and I'll walk into the kitchen and go. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> 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 anyway. Speaking of wise, we were in bed watching the vow. <laughs> watching Sorry. the what? The, the vow. vow. Okay. The cult thing. The, yeah. the next game cult thing. And I turned over to her and I was like, "I think I'd be a good cult leader." <laughs> and she was like, "Well, that's that's not that doesn't make me comfortable." And I was like. <laughs> For some reason, I kept at it. Like, yeah. Here's what <laughs> I would do. That sounds very Barrett. <laughs> uh, by the, I keep fucking this up for some reason today, and it's, I think, it, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. I'm going to start over. It's the whiskey. It is the whiskey from two days ago. <laughs> uh, 